Hi there, I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. You're tuned in to Video Radio, a special on-the-spot edition right here in palatial Kelowna, British Columbia. Yeah, November 1st, 2013. So if anybody remembers the phrase NAFTA, <laughs> you're going to realize that we're in a heap of trouble. We're got it live right here. Let's cover the story. Absolutely. Cheese was on everyone's mind in Ottawa today as Prime Minister Stephen Harper floated a trial balloon in caucus, suggesting the biggest trade deal since 1988's North American Free Trade Agreement is near completion. We are expanding our trade, he said. We will soon complete negotiations on a comprehensive economic and trade agreement with the European Union. To get something, Harper had to give something. And leaked details point to dairy farmers taking a hit. Dairy farmers are shocked by the magnitude of this uh, giveaway and uh, we are upset we are farmers across the country are angry the EU currently has the right to ship about 13,500 tons of cheese to Canada each year tariff free the new deal would more than double that to 30,000 tons it's significant because current duties on anything over that is more than 200 percent which largely freezes out foreign producers. I am very concerned that Stephen Harper will be throwing Canadian dairy farmers under the bus on this one. Now the quid pro quo is what's important here. It's believed Europe would allow more access for Canadian beef producers, as well as Canadian assembled cars. Why is this important? Because the EU has 28 members and 500 million consumers. We're getting access to a market that's between 15 and 20 times our size. So this is uh, potentially large and will be felt all across the economy. Now government officials are hoping dairy farmers look at the bigger numbers. 90% of what Canadians consume is made here. But based on initial reactions, they're in for a fight. For the deal to go through, Canada's 10 provinces and the EU's 28 members have to approve it. And the dairy farmers of Canada say it's very aware of that fact. Mike Drolet, Global News. So if you're rocking in the intelligence world, you understand that we're hooped. Absolutely. Uh, farmers are hooped. Dairy farmers are hooped. Yes, but there'll be lots of cheap cheese for consumers. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird. Uh, We've got apples from the United States coming into Kelowna, and we're in the middle of Appleville, okay? Absolutely, We're yeah. surrounded by trees. You see that? Trees! But we're selling American lumber in our local hardware store because it's cheaper. And we're probably going to be turning over some of our municipal services to European transnationals. We do have some videos online talking about one of the largest multinational corporations to take over municipal services operating right now. And you know that their little logo is going to be showing up in a city near you just because Harper is... Well, he made a promise that he was going to sign this trade deal. However, there is a little hitch in his plans. Somebody to have Aboriginal rights and human human rights? Say it's not so. And of course they don't really want to talk about that. Let's run the clip. The EU and Canada have tentatively agreed a free trade deal after more than four years of negotiations. The head of the European Commission said it could set the tone for a similar deal planned with the US. Certainly on our side we expect this uh, agreement to uh, set some standards also for other negotiations, including with our American uh, United States uh, friends. The deal would boost the 80 billion euros of EU-Canada annual bilateral trade by 20 percent. 98 percent of tariffs both ways will be removed immediately upon implementation of this agreement. Differences over agriculture hampered the talks. Canada demanded increased market access in Europe for its beef and pork, while boosting exports of Europe's cheeses had been another main stumbling block. If approved by EU leaders, MEPs and Canada's provinces, it would also make it easier for European companies to sell services in Canada and vice versa. The EU-Canada deal is being seen as a blueprint for the recently launched trade talks between Brussels and Washington. An example of how governments worldwide are preferring bilateral agreements on trade and investment. and perhaps shows the pessimism that clouds the chances of achieving a global trade deal through the World Trade Organization, where talks have long been deadlocked. 
James Franey, Euronews, Brussels. Okay, so right now we're going to check in on a clip. Uh, the Aboriginal rights are something that the world is paying attention to. And the world knows we're an apartheid nation right here in Canada, but... How it's not being covered by the corporate mainstream media. Yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, just check out, uh, we've got some videos coming up on that one. Municipal sustainability, we're going to be talking about the fact that, no, people aren't getting a fair shake, and that includes you. But that's why we do what we do. That's, that's exactly why. we got to get the word out there and share this, share this with your friends and neighbours. There's a little bit of a reaction. Oh. A little a bit little of a <laughs> on the internet right now. There's a little bit of a reaction about what's going on with this trade deal because we remember NAFTA. Yeah, and don't forget they're working on the other trade deal, the TPP. And remember, don't take our word for it. No, check out our sources and check out the information for yourself. Okay, because you got a brain cell. We're counting on it, but check this clip out. The news from Brussels has representatives from many Canadian industries lining up to cheer. We're coining it the Wayne Gretzky of trade deals. This is a big deal. We believe that this is a significant achievement. We're extremely pleased to see that this deal has finally gone through. It's a good thing for the canola industry. But not everyone is feeling like a winner. Dairy farmers are angry. There will now be more European cheeses available to Canadians, saying it will hurt production in this country. This is going to be potentially devastating for the fine cheese uh, segment of our, of our market. Uh, so the, the local artisanal cheesemakers stand to lose as much as a third of their share of the fine cheese market. Well, personally, I don't think there will be any hurt if there is any type of negative economic hurt that we will certainly look at compensation to keep them whole. We had, we had pledged that to them all along. Though how much compensation and how it will be distributed is still being worked out. Ottawa is also looking at compensation for provincial governments, which could wind up paying more if prescription drug costs go up. The deal is getting good grades from those governments everywhere from Alberta. It's going to make a tremendous difference to the way that our economy grows. It's very exciting and uh, we're very pleased with what we know so far. To Newfoundland and Labrador, Ontario and Quebec, all of whom had potential concerns about a deal. I think it's a very big deal. I think it's an historic agreement uh, in the same manner it, uh, the, the, the agreement with the U.S. was uh, an historic agreement. Quebec does say it wants to see the dairy compensation plan before approving the deal, but Quebec's finance minister says he's not worried because it's in Ottawa's best interest to make this deal work. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Montreal. So, a bit of a reaction. Exactly, but the media, you know, they're not going to tell the whole truth. Not the whole truth. You know, that is actually going to be more harmful to the Canadian economy, even though I don't even know what the economy is and why we need it. Well, remember, if you ever see mainstream news and they say the word economy, substitute the word bank profits, and then you'll figure out what they're talking about. Remember, fractional reserve lending, screwing a municipality near you. Ah, uh, yes. Speaking of municipal services, <laughs> uh, apparently the uh, Canadian nuclear plant in Ontario has a little issue with their nuclear waste. Yes, nuclear waste. Uh, there's a story in the Globe and Mail right now about the fact that they were donating to certain nonprofits, and they asked those nonprofits to support disposable uh, disposal of nuclear waste by burying it. But a few people in the States are a little upset about that idea. It's like everyone has the internet except the government. Let's check this out. At the largest nuclear power plant in the world, plans to store radioactive waste deep underground. Nearby homes and summer cottages line the beaches of Lake Huron. That's where opposition to burying the waste began, among those who've enjoyed the lakeside scenery for generations. Ontario Power Generation, a government-owned utility, wants to dig waste storage chambers 680 meters beneath the Bruce Power Plant site. Officials say the thick limestone bedrock won't allow radioactivity to contaminate land or water. Our studies indicate that there is no risk to Lake Huron. We understand the geology under the site, where we're going to be placing this waste, and we don't see any impact at all. 
Storing radioactive waste anywhere is controversial, but putting it next to a lake that's shared with the United States and provides drinking water to tens of millions of people is another level of challenge entirely. At public hearings into the waste storage issue, U.S. legislators came from neighboring Michigan to express their opposition. Community leaders in other U.S. states have also objected. The Great Lakes are our life and livelihood. Uh, they, they matter to us in Michigan um, as much as, if not more than anybody. We're, as a state, defined literally by the Great Lakes. But polls show widespread support for the nuclear industry in the quiet country towns around the Bruce Power Plant. Thousands of plant employees live here, and the community actively sought the construction of a waste storage facility. We wanted to be um, proactive and a lead, take a leadership position as opposed to, you know, um, uh, taking the easy way and, and just saying, no, we, we wouldn't consider it. This is Canada's first real attempt to deal with decades of accumulated waste and making a decision that satisfies all sides of the debate is probably going to be impossible. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera, Kin Carden. So I wonder what they're going to do with all that excess radio, radioactive material. I don't think they're going to be burying it deep underground like they want to. <laughs> do your research. You can't bury waste and think that you're going to get away with it. Come on, grow up. Maybe, uh, I don't know, do like Japan? Shut down all the nuclear reactors? Do like Germany? How about solar? Yeah, I know, but you know, yeah, it's clean energy, right? Right. I believe the government. <laughs> And so should you, because <laughs> if you don't, if you don't, the terrorists will win. Yes, that's right. If you don't side with us, you side with... At any rate, let's get out of here. We've got a thing coming up on fracking right now in Food Matters. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Thanks for tuning in. This is Video Radio. Since 1971, when President Nixon took the United States off what was left of the gold standard, the world has operated under a system of money called fiat. The dollar, the pound, the euro are all government fiat currencies. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be so. It is the law that this government currency be money. Indeed, without that legal enforcement and the fact that we must pay taxes in this money, that dollar bill or that computer digit that represents a dollar would be pretty much meaningless. Only the government has the power to issue fiat money, but banks can create it through lending. If somebody wants to borrow $10, a bank can create it from nowhere and lend it. It can then charge interest. Banks also create money by lending against an asset, such as a house. They're given the deeds to the house, and they create the money out of nowhere and lend it. At interest, of course. But who benefits? Of course, those that have the power to issue money. Governments and banks. They haven't had to do anything productive, they just create money. However money is created, be it through lending, fractional reserve banking, financial bailouts, or old-fashioned money printing, banks are always at or near the top of the money-issuing pyramid. In reality, this process of creating money only redistributes wealth from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And thus that ever-increasing gulf between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger.